Okay, so I'm going to get started because there's there's quite a lot to get through. Um, but thank you, as Kirsty said, for for joining us for for the session today. I'd imagine that we've got a lot of people who are new to the role. Um, some people who have probably are more familiar with it even than I am, and others who maybe haven't done it for a while. Um, but we'll we'll cover everything that's involved in in supporting our probationers and in TIS. And today, in particular, we're focusing around um, primary probationers. So perhaps a bit of an unusual order in this, in that I'm going to start by thanking you, not just for, for joining us today, but for stepping up to the role of supporter or mentor. I realise that the different authorities use a different use different terms. Um, I think for me, it's a role that isn't given as high a profile as it as it deserves. Um, you probably don't have the, the luxury that I do of actually hearing from the probationers at the end of the year just about the difference that the supporter has made to them. Um, your role is obviously to support and to challenge the probationer as, as they go through. Um, and the teacher induction scheme really wouldn't be what it is, um, world class. It really wouldn't be that without you doing what you do. So, so from us all at GTC, I really want to thank you for that. I'd imagine for those of you listening today, there are many reasons um, why you've stepped up to become a supporter. And what I'm interested to know is what's your reason? So Kirsty is just going to run a quick little poll for us on that. We'll just uh, leave that up for a couple of minutes just to let everyone um, answer. So uh, the results um, just explain. So that's 55% um, have said that they want to make a positive difference to new teachers, which is great. Um, quite a lot of people kind of doing it out of choice, it seems as well. So that's uh, really good. And we'll just uh, hand back over to the presentation. OK, thank you. So um, over the course of the year, hopefully you're going to further develop some of your own attributes while you're in the role of, of supporter. Um, and you're probably looking at this just now and hopefully these words that are jumping out at you of being inspirational, empathetic, creative, patient, um, a listener, creative, patience, it's all jumping out, these same words, enthusiastic. These are things that you will recognise in yourself over the course of the year. And I suppose what we're asking you to do is to think about the role that you'll be taking over the year actually as professional learning for yourself. So not only are you giving in terms of supporting and challenging um, the probationer, you're also developing professionally as well. Um, and these are some of the attributes that, that you will develop as, as you go through. Your interim or the interim profile, which you'll be supporting the probationer with, runs from August to December. And then there's a final profile which runs from January through until May or June. Your probation manager will set the dates for the submission of these profiles. So it's worth checking with them when they want them to be submitted. Ultimately, the profile is the responsibility of the probationer to get it actually submitted on time. Um, but obviously, I know that you'll want to have these dates in your diary and know what you're, what you're working towards. There's going to be a checkpoint as well in October. So normally, some local authorities may do uh, some sort of return in October through choice. This year, because of um, COVID and the situation that the probationers have, have been in, in terms of finishing their um, ITE experience, 
we're going to put in a very brief return in October, which allows you um, to share with the probationer how they're doing in terms of their progress, whether it's satisfactory, whether it's a cause for concern or whether it's unsatisfactory. And I know that's very early on in October, but it just breaks that bit between August and December. Um, December is quite late for somebody to hear that they're actually a cause for concern. So we're going to do a quick checkpoint in October, which will just be uh, an A4 sheet that's returned to your, your local authority, um, and that will be sent on, on to us. So, and it's all about support, to highlight who needs support from then on. So the interim profile runs August to December. A recommendation is made by the head teacher in December, either for satisfactory, a cause for concern, either for health or for competence or both, or unsatisfactory. And these are the words that you'll find coming up through the interim profile, the interim two profile if required, and the final profile, satisfactory, cause for concern or unsatisfactory. The profile starts off with the IPDAP, and you'll find at the GCC that we love an acronym, and the more complicated we can make it, the better. So this one is the Initial Professional Development Action Plan, and it comes right at the start of the, the interim profile. So this, when the probationer opens this um, part of the profile, it will probably already be populated because they've completed an ITE profile. So when they were at university, they've completed their key strengths and areas for development. Or I think it's development needs, it's called an ITE profile. That will be copied across into their interim profile. So when they're coming to you, they've already recognised, if you like, what they'd like to work on over the course of the year and actually what the strengths are as well. This section can be edited though, and we would suggest that right at the start of um, the year, so just now in one of your supporter meetings, that you sit down with the probationer and discuss what's in their IPDAP. Um, so, because they may have completed it, for example, having taught in a, in a large urban school um, where they had you know, stage partners, and it may be now that they're actually working in a multi-composite rural school. So actually they're their development needs could be quite different going ahead over the, the course of the year. So that can be edited. If it is blank, that's not a big deal at all. It's just that the probationer then has to type in right from the beginning what they want to do over the course of the year. They don't have anything to go in as a starter or that they can actually edit. Our suggestion would be that there's one agreed target an action in each of the professional areas of the standard. So there are three professional areas that I'll keep talking about. That's the professional values, the knowledge and understanding, and the skills and abilities. Those are the three areas. And our suggestion would be that there's one target in each of those three areas, a maximum of two targets in each area. So you're looking for between three and six things to be written in there. The important thing for the probationer to remember is that they have to be achievable by December. So we're almost already in September. You know, it won't be long before we're there. Um, there's bound to be, I'm sure you'll agree, more disruption than there would be normally at the start of term as people get back into routines and establishing ways of working. So please help them to keep these targets manageable. Um, and not, not too big. It may be that they have something really quite big that you need to help them to chunk down um, and put in something that they're going to actually manage to meet by December. This is completed by the probationer um, and can be edited by you. The way that each part of the profile works is that it's completed by the probationer and they submit it to the supporter to be signed off. And as a supporter, you can either sign it off or you can reject it. And I always think reject is actually quite a harsh word. It's basically that you're sending it back and there's nothing wrong with sending it back. It should be a conversation between you and the probationer. So if they submit, for example, their IPDAP to you, you don't feel that it's quite what you discussed, that there's something that needs a bit of clarification, you would simply reject it to them. They would make the, they would edit it, make the adjustment and send it back to you and you could then sign it off at that point. What you don't want to do is to sign it off and then say, actually, that wasn't quite right. We need to change that because there's no way of you doing that or within the authority. 
you actually have to contact the GTC to get something unlocked and set back so that you can do that. And we, we can do that, but you know, there are there are a lot of probationers, there's over 3,000 on TIS. Um, so it's not something that we would be encouraging people to do. So don't hesitate to reject things and, and send them back. The timetable. Um, so the contact time for a probationer should be at a maximum of 18 hours. Um, some people like to think about how much non-contact time do I have. I find it much easier for a probationer to think about as long as they, have, they sit between the minimum and the maximum contact time, then their timetable is fine. So pupils are in for 25 hours. A full-time teacher is, has class contact time um, of, or is, is teaching rather for 22 and a half hours. A probationer has a maximum contact time of 0 0.8 or 18 hours and a minimum time of 0 0.5 or 12 hours 23 minutes. So that might mean that if you have two probationers at your school, you could have one probationer who has class contact time of 13 hours and another probationer who has class contact time of 17 hours. Both of those are acceptable. Okay, and um, that's absolutely fine. It cannot go above the 18 hours on average over the course of a year. Scottish Government have um, set these expectations and they've said that it can creep up to a maximum of 18 and a half, but on average it has to be 18 hours. Okay, so, and the, these are times when the probationer has full responsibility. They're responsible for the planning, for the delivery, and for the evaluation of the lessons as well. So any team teaching, um, or assembly time, things like that, those all count as professional learning. It's when they are planning and delivering the lesson, that's what counts as class contact time. What it equates to is that they will have probably just over a day of non-contact time. And that non-contact time is for professional learning. It's not their day out, as some people like to call it, um, in terms of I'm, I'm not really doing an awful lot, it's, it's my day out and I can choose what I do. Yes, they can choose what they do, but it's absolutely about professional learning because it's unlikely that at any point again, will they get this amount of time to actually engage in, in professional learning. But I'll talk about that as, as we go through. Um, they complete their timetable in August and there's no need after they submitted it to then keep updating it. So let's say, for example, um, they change from doing a block of music to a block of PE. They don't have to change that in the timetable. Their, their balance of time is still the same. And as long as for us, it's between 12 hours 23 and 18, we're happy with that. So we realise that there will be small changes as they go through. They'll have a chance to update it again in, in January. It's completed by the probationer and submitted to the supporter again for, for sign off. One of the, the key things about the teacher induction scheme experience is the weekly supporter meeting. And this is what makes it very, very attractive, is that they will meet with you once a week. Now, the meetings will probably vary slightly in length. There'll be some weeks where there's so much to talk about and other weeks where there isn't an awful lot. The meetings, if possible, should happen during the school day, during that non-contact time. But I know that sometimes that's physically impossible if the supporter is actually the person who covers the class to let the probationer be non-contact. So it's trying to find a way of a way of working that. I would suggest that if they are before school or after school, put an end time on them so that they don't go on too long. Um, because strictly speaking, they, they should be within within the school day. There should be one every week and so we ask for a minimum of 12 meetings for the interim profile. It's the responsibility of the probationer to write up the meetings. What people do that's often very effective is that they actually type up a summary while the meeting is taking place on their iPad, on the computer um, and then that's it done and, and they can submit it that way. It doesn't have to be war and peace, it doesn't have to have every detail in, it's basically a summary. Our suggestion would be that the probationer submits an agenda to you a couple of days in advance so that you know what they would actually like to discuss. And they also, the probationer chooses two focus points to use as the key themes, if you like, for, for the meeting. The focus points are areas of the standard for full registration. 
Um, so they may choose something around assessment and they may choose something, for example, around working with parents. Um, I always say that supporting meetings are the property of the probationer. So if there's a large area like reporting or assessment, the probationer wants to keep revisiting, that's absolutely fine. It's not a case that they have to, over the course of the supporter meetings, make sure that they've covered every area of the standard. It's about what's going to be of most use to them as, as they move through. Probationer writes up the record of the meeting, submits it to the, to the supporter, and you sign it off. We again would stress with the probationer that they should be doing that weekly um, so that these things don't, don't mount up. We would suggest that they use 20 minutes, half an hour of their non-contact time every week just to keep their profile up to date. So observations. Um, over the course of the year, there are a total of nine observations. Normally, we would say five between August and December and then four between January and June. We're being a bit flexible around that because of the, the situation that, that we're in with, with COVID. Um, so it may be that there are four before Christmas and there are five from January to June. That's absolutely fine. We've also just met with probation managers just now. And again, you know, we're saying that we will be flexible about actually what can count as an observation because we realise that if the classroom is at capacity in terms of number of people that are allowed within the class for um, due to social distancing, you may not be able to physically able to allow somebody else to come into the room. So it could be a case of recording a lesson, filming a lesson, having an in-depth discussion around the planning and how the lesson went. We'll be flexible about that, but we would ask that there is there is one face-to-face -face observation. Um, but we we would ask you to liaise with your probation manager um, around that and what, what those might look like if there are any issues. The observations should be on a three weekly cycle. So I would again suggest that at the moment the probationer gets the dates in the diary for when these are actually going to happen because if they get them in now um, that, that's them there if you like. They don't have to know the content of them at this point but allows them to plan towards them. So it should be that they, they have an observation, there's a bit of time to enable them to get the feedback, there's time for them to actually implement what the feedback has been, and then time for them to start planning for the next one, and then the next one happens, and that's the same sort of cycle as, as they go on. It shouldn't be the same person observing all the observations. It's very unusual if the head teacher doesn't do at least one observation, because ultimately it's the head teacher who is making the recommendation. Um, so perhaps at this stage as well, the observations could go in, um, ensuring that there is a mix of people. The majority of them will be done by you, I would imagine, as a supporter. In primary, it's important to um, choose different areas of the curriculum, different times of the day. Um, so, you know, perhaps people would like to do Tuesday after break, that would be fine, or uh, a Wednesday first thing. Make sure you include that slot after lunch or last thing in the day. Um, that there's there's um, you know active lessons as well as ones that are, are more sitting sitting in seats. Um, that's just getting the mix over over the course of, of the year. The probationer writes up the record of the observation and they submit it to the supporter to sign off. So depending on how you give your feedback. If it's oral feedback that you give, the probationer may make some notes. If it's um, that you give written feedback, they may just copy and paste that in, or they may summarise it and include it in their um, observation notes and then submit that to you to sign off. Okay. CLPL, so professional learning. Um, this hopefully will be overflowing by the end of uh, the year, as in by December. So the probationer needs to be aware that it's not just courses that count, it's any piece of professional learning that the probationer has engaged in, whether it's during the school day or after the school day. What we're not recording here are the 35 hours that are required. Your school will have another way of recording that. What we're wanting to see are all the opportunities that the probationer has engaged in in order for them to professionally develop. You'll see when, when they go into this part of the profile that there is um, 
local authority professional learning, there's school professional learning, and there's personal professional learning. So, for example, if the probationer had a particular interest in additional support needs, they may, for example, have gone to a probationer session around ESN. That would be recorded as a, a course under local authority professional learning. Then within the school, there's a working group that are developing policy around ESN and the probationer volunteers to become part of that working group. That would count as school professional learning and they would record it in there. It may be that in their own time, um, because it's a particular interest of theirs, they have engaged in some professional reading around ESN. That would be recorded under personal. I wouldn't get too caught up about which column they go in. Nobody's not got the full registration because they've put something in the wrong column. But that's just an example of how it will, um, or what, what the expectations are, if you like, in each column. There will be empty boxes. We're not looking at all for, for probationers to fill every box. Um, we're just asking that they record all the professional learning they've engaged in. So it could be reading, it could be research on the internet, it could be inquiry, it could be observation of other teachers, it could be part of a work, being part of a working group, it could be a course, all these different things, okay? They submit the professional learning and submit to their supporter to sign off. As a supporter, you may want to look at a way of providing an opportunity for the probationer to share their professional learning with other staff, and um, perhaps with a stage partner or um, within the, their particular stage in, in the school, because it's something that is of great value to other people as well. And the probationer will be engaging in some excellent professional learning as, as they go through. The minimum requirement for professional learning is two entries in each of the three areas. So the three areas again being the professional values, the skills and abilities, the knowledge and understanding. Two entries in each. So actually the minimum requirement is six entries. The, the danger is that once they've submitted six, they get a chance to, or they get asked if they wish to submit for sign off. They absolutely don't. They don't want to submit this until December. Okay, if they do submit it by mistake, then of course we can unlock it and, and set it back. Um, but just to be aware of that, they don't want to, to submit it too early. This area here, the key strengths and areas for development is your area. So probationer doesn't fill in any of this at all. What they may do, we would ask them to do would be to prompt you to let to give you a reminder if you like that you have this area to to complete so you're reflecting over their progress and it's the progress that's the important bit from august to december so so far what have the key strengths been and what are their areas for development and areas for development as you're aware, doesn't mean that there's something that's not satisfactory. We all have areas for development. Um, so there is a requirement to put in an area for development in, in every um, box that, that's there. It will take you a wee while to do this, so allow a, allow a wee bit time for it. The ideal is that the supporter completes this in draft and then shares it with the probationer. You would then both sit down to write this part, the PDAP, the Professional Development Action Plan, based on what's been in the key strengths and areas for development. Um, and it may be that when you share that, that previous bit, the key strengths in draft with the probationer, there may be something that isn't in there that they would like you to include. For example, the fact that they've taken a music group um, every Tuesday lunchtime, you know, for, for the second term. And you know, it, you've just completely forgotten about it. So, so they may come back and give you something that you would that they would like you to include in that. Once they've seen that, it should be really clear and through a discussion about so what is my action plan going forward then to take me from January through to June when I get my final profile. That would be discussed between both of you. The probationer would then write up this part, the PDAP, at the end of their, their interim profile. Again, thinking about what's going to be achievable, because this is about what they're going to manage to fit in between January and June. And as we all know, things don't get any quieter. If anything, it gets even busier with interviews and things will, will come in as well. 
um, and application forms to be completed. So they, they complete this as they go through. They put a date in terms of when do they want to achieve that by? Is it by February? Is it by April? When, does it, when should it be? And what you should make sure of is if there is an area that's causing concern in terms of the progress so far, that must feature in the PDAP so that the probationer is very clear that that's an area that they should be working on from, from January onwards. Okay? This PDAP will be copied across to the final profile, um, so it won't have to be written out again. The final stage is then of the interim profile. Once everything is completed, a green arrow appears at the top left of the main profile page. If the arrow isn't there, it means that something hasn't been signed off. It doesn't mean it's broken. It doesn't mean it's not working. It means that something hasn't been signed off. If you are spending hours with the probationer trying to work out what it is that hasn't been signed off, please give us a call at GTC and we will be able to tell you. Um, we quite often get calls from people saying it's, it's not working, it's absolutely broken. Um, and it's just always that something is, is not signed off. So once that green arrow is clicked, that submits the completed profile to you to make a recommendation. So you make the recommendation in the first instance of satisfactory, cause for concern, unsatisfactory. It's about their progress. So has the progress been satisfactory towards meeting the SFR? So there's no expectation at this point that they will have met the SFR in every area. But how's their progress towards it? Is it a cause for concern for health or for competence? Now, health would be if they've missed a large number of days, not just two or three days because of a flu bug. Um, but, you know, if, if they've missed sort of 20 days, then we'd be looking at a cause for concern for health. And that would mean that they would be looking to do an extension which made up the days missed. Or they could be a cause for concern for competence. So, actually you have concerns about their behaviour management um, and it's not where you would hope that it would be, their progress is not where you would hope it would be by December. Um, so your cause for concern is for competence or your concern is greater than that and actually it's unsatisfactory um, and there may be two or three areas that you're really quite concerned about. The reason for highlighting the causes for concern and unsatisfactory is to enable support to go in. So it's kind of flipping it around to make it a positive, if you like, because as soon as you submit a profile which highlights this concern, then the probation manager is going to be involved as well in terms of drawing up an action plan and really focusing in on what these areas of, of concern are. Once you've made your recommendation, that recommendation goes to the head teacher. So the head teacher then logs in, they read the profile, everything that's been written, and they confirm or change the recommendation. Okay, and, and that does happen sometimes that the, the head teacher says, actually, I don't agree with that. I've seen the probationer. I think it should be this recommendation. The probationer will then receive a confirmation email advising them of the recommendation that has been made. It's really important, therefore, that details are kept up to date on the, the MyGTCS account or they won't get that confirmation um, email. So in January, if the recommendation was a cause for concern or unsatisfactory, then the probationer will actually get an interim two profile, which gives them a, a second chance, if you like, at getting things back on track and getting things back to a satisfactory. And if so, that would come in by the end of March. We haven't really mentioned that in great detail to, to probationers because it's something that, first of all, very few probationers have, but also the probation manager and you would be able to support them with that. It's simply that when they next click into my GTCS, they would have an interim two profile sitting there. If the recommendation has been satisfactory, then a final profile will be available for them to access in January when they log in. So our advice again would be when it comes to December and making that recommendation, if you're not sure, if you're kind of caught between are they satisfactory or are they causing concern, our advice in December 
would be flag it up as a cause for concern because it's actually kinder in the long term to share the concerns that earlier on and allow the probationer the time to make the progress to get it back on track than the flip side of that is to not say anything because you don't really want to upset them and have that difficult conversation so you don't say anything things don't improve and then as time goes on and you're getting towards actually the final recommendation you're going to have to say to them actually I have got concerns about certain areas so they've missed that chance of getting some some extra support or some concentrated support so normally what would happen in December is that we will get quite a lot of profiles in which have a recommendation of cause for concern or unsatisfactory and when they come in in the final um, recommendation it's far far fewer than that because the support's gone in and and things have improved um, the pass rate is really, really high in terms of teacher induction schemes. So every year, let's say we've got over 3,000 probationers starting each year on TIS. Um, it's up at about 97% who will, will pass and gain full registration. And of the 3% who don't, that's including people who have deferred, who have chosen to withdraw. Um, so it's not, you know, within that, there's a small number who actually haven't met the standard, but um, it's, it's pretty small. So think carefully about what the recommendation is that you, um, that you make. So the interim two profiles, as I say, if, if they are cause for concern or unsatisfactory, the interim two profiles are submitted just before Easter. And then those probationers go on to the final profile, the same as the other probationers. Um, the final profile, it's the same process again, basically, as the interim profile. Slightly um, different number of observations. If you've done five before Christmas, there's only four to do from January onwards. Um, and it's submitted in May or June. And again, the probation manager will, will share the date of that submission with you. That, recommend, or that profile then comes in, the final profile comes in in um, May or June. And at that point, the recommendation is made for full registration, extension, or for cancellation. Okay. Now, the important words within all of that is um, that it's a recommendation. So it gives the probationer a chance. They can, of course, challenge the recommendation that has been made. And again, they can actually appeal it so that it does go to a panel to consider any recommendations. If it's for extension, then it's exactly as it says on the tin. It's about extending the days that are required before a probationer actually achieves um, their full registration. And that would typically happen the next school session, whether it's for competence or for, for health. If you recommend cancellation, then that is actually about removing a teacher from the register. So they are unable to teach. They, they will no longer have their provisional registration um, and they will be unable to apply for any posts for at least a two year period. They can apply um, after two years to get back onto the register and they have to evidence that they've engaged in some sort of professional learning to overcome the areas which have caused the recommendation for cancellation in, in the first place. Um, so that's what, what comes in and then either the extensions take place or the certificates of full registration go, go out. So I think I have whizzed through that and I've got time for a few questions if there's anything that's still outstanding. So I just yeah wanted to thank you all for your, your time for, for joining us. There, there's two email addresses there. One is PLD, which if over the course of the year um, you've got any questions about TIS probationers or about flexible route probationers or the probationers themselves have any questions, please don't hesitate um, to get in touch. And that's my email address as well if it's something that you'd, you'd rather just contact me directly about. So best of luck over the course of the year and I really hope I get a chance to engage with you through some of the other webinars as well. Thank you.